What if this statement was, you are what you don't eat? What if you grew up in a home where body image was so important that at times you would starve your body, hoping to sort of meet the expectations of your parents or their friends? My guest today is Sherry Siegel Glick. She's just published her first book titled The Skinny, My Messy, Hopeful Fight for a Full Recovery from Anorexia. Dear 14-year-old, I know that you feel like anorexia is part of your identity. It's not. It's an illness. Anorexia doesn't make you special or worthy. You are special and worthy because you are a person who exists in the world. What feels like admiration from people around you is probably sadness. And even if it's not, in this diet culture society, the people who admire your self-control and your thinness still get to live their whole lives. Their admiration is fleeting and they wouldn't trade places with you for anything. They aren't missing shared meals and experiences to stay in a small body. They understand that's not a fair trade. It's a memoir that chronicles her recovery from years of battling and eating disorder. And Sherry opens up about her struggle and sheds light on the path to healing and conquering the insidious beast that claims more lives than any other mental illness, anorexia. What's surprising about her book, she also weaves in insights into human nature and the often humorous situations that come with it. This is Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. Sherry, welcome to Chatter That Matters. Thanks so much. So why did you write this book? You're a devoted mother of three. You find time to chair the parent council at your children's school. You're a lawyer, you're an accomplished journalist. Your work's been in magazines and newspapers. You've helped draft federal legislation. I mean, you've done a lot. With so much dedication and achievement, why share your story of fighting an eating disorder that was so out of control that it even put you in a hospital? Um, I mean, I think the reason I wrote the book is because there's so much secrecy and shame around eating disorders. And um, by coming out of the shadows, that's the only way to, to change things because eating disorders thrive in secrecy. And I think by writing this book, people can see themselves and their loved ones and know that things can be different and better. And if we don't talk about these things, nothing changes. Was there anyone in your life or even that sort of tiny whisper that sometimes haunts us when we're making a decision like this, where you're worried that by bringing this story out, you would be judged differently. People would be glancing at the food on your plate, thinking of you in a completely different way than sort of the accomplishments I listed a few seconds ago. I mean, yeah, sure. People worry about judgment all the time. That's human nature. Um, But I think sort of in life also, we have to weigh things, you know, like we have to weigh sort of the pros and the cons and, and what the benefits are versus the costs. And I just thought the benefits to talking about this outweighed the costs. And the other thing that it's, I'm interested about is this is a serious subject and your story is, is haunting at times, but you find a way to weave humor into it. Why humor? I mean, why did you think that humor was an important chord to play in a subject that was that was about your life and struggles. Because I wanted to write the kind of book, not only the kind of book that I would want to read, but it had to be the kind of book I would want to write. And humor is really important to me and in the way I move through the world. I would have had a lot of trouble writing a book that wasn't funny because I like humor is how I communicate with people. I also think that a lot of really important things can be said through humor. I think it's, I didn't write, want to write another sort of sad, maudlin, depressing recovery memoir. Um, I, I wanted to write something that was, could be equal parts, um, serious and important, but also not hard to read. I interviewed a guest recently that said, no matter what the crisis, you can always find good in the situation. Is Would it be a fair statement of you that no matter what the crisis is situation, there's always humor in a situation? Absolutely. I think, you know, I think that that's for me anyway, it's sort of what gets me through life. Um, you know, when you're, when you're a parent, especially with like young children, if you don't see the humor, I I don't know, I don't know what you do. You just like sit in a corner and cry maybe because, you know, you, you have to see the humor in these situations. And it was the same when I was in the day hospital program and I was just like, Oh my gosh, I just got in trouble for talking about cat vomit. (laughs) (laughs) Either I can laugh about this or I can have a nervous breakdown. Those are my two options. Um, so even in the moment, even though those things were very hard, I 
thought, you know, I could do something with this. This is also very funny. Well, let's talk about moments because I did a little bit of research on it and they talk about anorexia as both genetic and an environmental component. That sometimes Mm -hmm. it happens because of the moments you're in. And I'd love to talk about your family and because you talk a lot about it in your book and their relationship with food, fitness and body image. Sure. Yeah. I don't, though, I, I will say, I don't think the description at the beginning about, you know, starving myself to be accepted into my family is a fair description of my family. I think that it, you know, it was also of the time it was the eighties or, you know, like the, the late seventies, I guess. No, it was the eighties was the eighties. So I think that that was just sort of a very common way people spoke about food and bodies in those days. I think that, you know, it was not, there was never any malice in the way my parents talked about my body. They honestly thought that they were helping me because to them, the way you look is a very important part of your identity. And so I think they were actually just trying to save me. Um, They were doing the best they could with what they knew. And um, so while food um, and exercise and bodies were talked about in my house in a way that I wouldn't talk about them with my children in in my, in my house, in my life now, I, again, I don't think it was, there was any malice on their part. I'm not suggesting malice, but let's talk about your book because you call it a Garden of Eden moment. You're at your friend's Lisa's house. They want to serve you food. You call home for permission. What happens? Yeah, well, I mean, it was it was candy. Um, so I'd already had a, you know, I'd, I'd had lunch and my mom had implemented a one sweet a day rule because I was a little bit chubby and she was hoping to get that under control. And so she put me on, I guess, what was a diet um, that we weren't calling it that. She was saying one sweet a day. And I, so I called my mom and said, can I have this taffy? Cause that would have been my second suite that day. And my mom said, picture skinny little Lisa in her bathing suit and then picture yourself and decide. And then I got off the phone and said to Lisa, I was like, my mom said, yes. But what I say in the book about my garden of Eden moment is that in that moment, it was sort of the first time I'd experienced what I would later to learn was guilt. I want to move the story to the winter grade six. I think you're around 11 or 12 on a family trip to Grenada and a client of your dad's makes an off the cuff comment. What was it? Well, he was talking about his granddaughter and he said, you know, my daughter, my granddaughter is hefty like Sherry. And, um, for whatever reason that sort of that, that comment gutted me and I ran out of the room crying. It was sort of one of those death by a thousand cuts situations. It was the first time anyone other than my parents had mentioned my body. And so I think for me, I was like, oh my gosh, like it's not just my parents who can see that I'm chubby. It's this guy too. It's other people can see it too. And I think that's why that hurts so much. Because prior to that, any comments my parents had made, it sort of rolled off my back. The following day, I mean, it's not just a comment that you kind of bothers you for a couple hours. You start making decisions. You ask your mom that day, Mm -hmm. you know, what's more fattening, a a breakfast or a Snickers bar? Yeah, because I'd skipped breakfast that morning. And then we were at the airport. We were flying from Grenada to Barbados and they had Snickers bars at the airport. And so that's that was sort of, I didn't know. I had no idea about nutrition or calories or what was fattening or what wasn't. She answered both. I mean, she didn't. Yeah, she was like, I don't know both. Yeah. Um, Because she, because I think that for her, because for me, this was this pivotal moment that changed the course of my life. And for her, she was wrangling three children at the airport. So it just kind of shows um, how something that can be, you know, life changing for one person might not be, it might be a non-event for another person. And I think that's a fair point for people listening. This isn't all about, because my mom said one, two or three things, they started this lifelong battle. But I think one of the lessons that people need to to think about is sometimes what seems like an off the cuff comment, in your case, your mom dealing with three kids and just trying to give you an answer to satisfy you is something that can resonate much deeper. And I think that's a telling part of your book that for a lot of people saying, well, you know, I didn't know I was doing that. It's very possible you didn't, but those those comments have an impact. I think positive and negative comments have an impact. And this is something that we kind of are learning now because even once I, you know, lost the weight, you know, by the end of grade six, I didn't have much weight to lose. And I was getting all of these very, very, very positive comments about my body and my appearance. And that was actually just as damaging because then it was a message to me that that was the most important thing about me and that I had to keep it up. And it's the same with, you know, our children now, if you're constantly commenting about how pretty and tiny somebody is, 
people start to think that that is the most important thing about them. So it's better, no co- positive comments, no negative comments, no comments on people's bodies, I think should be sort of everybody's uh, mantra at this point. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. All of the things that we're told all of the time about how you have to move more and eat less, or is like that's the opposite of what you're doing in recovery. So there are these moments where I certainly felt really, really sorry for myself. My guest today is Sherry Siegel Glick. She's published her first book titled The Skinny, My Messy Hopeful Fight for Full Recovery from Anorexia. And I was kind of push back in my heels a bit when your mom's talking, you know, you've lost this weight in grade six, but you keep at it and you start really focusing on it. And she makes a comment. Your mom makes a comment. Again, this isn't about your mom. This is just about, you know, relationships and how they impact. Your mom makes a comment to your teacher that you're good at math because you spend so much time counting calories. Yeah. She thought that was funny. Um, I think which also just goes to show that she didn't really understand the impact this was having on my life. You know, she was, and my parents were, again, I think it was of the time they were very proud of my self-control. So they, they thought that it was amazing that I could, you know, turn down dessert or turn down things that were quote unquote unhealthy. Whereas now we understand that the most unhealthy thing to do is actually restricting food, right? Like there's nothing more unhealthy than being afraid of food. And looking back at your life now, we're going to get into sort of the struggles. When do you think the tipping point happened from it being something that you were concerned about to obsessed or even what a lot of people describe and and rightfully so, a a mental illness? Oh, yeah. It's it's absolutely a mental illness. You know, it's uh, like the eating disorders are biopsychosocial. Part of it is genetic and part of it is, you know, the, the environment that you're in. And if you're somebody like me who has the genetics for anorexia, it's like being a drug addict or an alcoholic. Like you, you have found the thing that makes everything feel easier um, in the same way a drug addict, they start using drugs, you know, and when you talk to people who have gone through this, you know, it's hard to know the exact moment where it turned into a full blown, you know, eating disorder versus just trying to watch my weight. Um, I, you know, I think for me, definitely by the time I was in grade seven, it had turned into something that I was no longer in control of. And grade eight is, is a, just a very emotional time. You're talking about your grade eight graduation. You're, you've got a date with a hottie and time to order dinner. And you said that is when it, the sort of the cat came out of the bag and it wasn't something I could hide anymore because my friends realized something was going on. Yeah. I think actually my, my close friends, like I had a pretty good group of friends who all knew because by starting in grade seven, I wasn't bringing lunch to school anymore. So they had all noticed then, but we went out with a big extended friend group um, in grade eight. It was like a huge group of us. And we'd gone to this restaurant we were eating on the patio. It all felt very, very grown up. I had ordered Caesar salad. You know, I talk about this in the book, this moment of panic set in. I, I was like, how did I eat that? Like I was kind of halfway through when I thought, oh my gosh, this, this dressing is so creamy and these croutons are so greasy and how am I eating this? And I thought, how do I get rid of this? And so then I went to the bathroom and, you know, made myself throw up and somebody heard me throwing up. And like, this is not, throwing up is not something that I, I did through the course of my eating disorder. That was a isolated incident. For me, that was not um, something that I, <laughs> that worked for me. Um, but th- that incident, um, sort of, she came back to the table and told everybody what had happened. And so then 13 and 14 year olds tried to stage th- this intervention, um, which was, you know, very dramatic and very ineffective. And I begged them not to tell my parents and, uh, it, it was obvious that it was it was a pretty big problem. And, you know, please don't tell my parents, but when did your parents find out and when did they realize that they had to have an intervention to kind of help help you deal with this? I think they knew there was a problem even when I was in middle school. You know, maybe even when my mom made that comment at the grade eight meet the teacher night, she might have even known it was a problem, but was sort of making light of it. I'm not sure when they realized it was really a problem. But that summer, I did go to sleepaway camp. The camp ended up calling my parents because I was, um, I was afraid of all the food and I was spending a lot of my free time exercising. 
so when I got home from summer camp and the camp was also weighing me once a week. Um, and so once I got home from summer camp, I had an appointment at the children's hospital. And did you go into the hospital or was it more just an appointment there? My first appointment was sort of the fall of grade nine. And we met with this doctor who had told my parents that, um, who had told me, sorry, it was me and my dad who told me that I had to gain a certain number of pounds per week to avoid admission and that I'd be weighed once a week. I was terrified. I, first of all, I didn't want to be hospitalized. I didn't want to be forced to gain weight. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to miss school and miss out on being with my friends and have everybody know why I was gone. I started drinking copious amounts of fluid, like, like a ridiculous amount of fluid and before I was weighed. And so the next week I went back and I gained um, 14 pounds in liquid. My eating habits hadn't changed. I looked exactly the same. My mom had said to the doctor, you know, is it possible she's manipulating her weight? Because how is this even possible? And the doctor said, don't worry, only no, not more than a couple of pounds. It's, it's, don't worry, it's fine. And so I kept doing that. Um, and I will say that, first of all, I'm sure now they check for these things. They probably do urine tests um, when you go in for a weigh-in. So if anybody thinks that this is a good idea, it is not a good idea. Also, it made me very, very, very ill. My teeth would chatter. I was dizzy. My vision would blur. I thought I was going to throw up every time from all of the liquid. I would spend. I would skip my last few classes in the afternoon and just sit there and drink. Like I would drink diet pop, like bottles of diet pop. And um, now I know how dangerous water intoxication is that I could have ended up with brain damage or dead. So if anybody's listening and thinks this is a good idea, it's actually a terrible idea. And I am so thankful that nothing terrible happened while I was doing that water loading. Yeah, you almost have this Jerry Seinfeld quality to you where it's about insights, that you're always looking around and observing. Do you think that's part of what someone with anorexia has that you're consumed by? Because you're so talented at sort of picking out these different parts and even, I think, being quite critical about how the hospital would treat people of your age. Uh, thank you. No, I, I don't think that it's a common characteristic of people with anorexia. I think it's a common characteristic of writers. I think as a writer, I'm somebody who observes people and can write about it and talk about it. So Sherry, talk to me about when you no longer could game the system and they put you in hospital. I knew when my appointments were. So what I would do is I would skip my last couple of classes in the afternoon and buy these big two liter bottles of Diet Pop and sit in this area of the school and just drink. One of my friends told my parents what I was up to, which I didn't find out for many, many, many years because I definitely would have unfriended that person on the spot if I'd known. Um, and so my dad showed up one day on a day that I wasn't supposed to have a way in to take me for a way in. And I was panicked because I knew, I knew what I'd been doing and I knew that my weight wouldn't be high enough. And once they weighed me, I'd be admitted. And I was, it was devastating. I, it was, it was just absolutely terrifying. Um, you know, the only sort of like glimmer of happiness was that I, my dream of having a television in my room had finally come to fruition. And how did you feel about your dad at that time? Cause that's, it was almost an attack. If he sort of took you in the middle of the school week, you couldn't game the system, he changed the rules on you. Or did you just come to terms and almost feel glad that the whole trickery was over? You know, I, I actually just, I talk about this in the book a little bit, um, just the car ride there. I just felt like a burden, you know, that he had to take time off in the middle of his work day, in the middle of his work week to take me to the hospital. I felt like he was sort of irritated. I, you know, I didn't really understand what was going through my parents' head or not because we didn't really talk about it. Um... But I just remember, you know, I was admitted and then he left me there and went home to get clothes and stuff for me and um, just feeling so alone. That must have been terrifying. Yeah, it was. You know, like I was, I guess, 14 and, you know, they handed me this copy of the, you know, the Canadian Mental Health Act. And they, I remember the nurse saying, this is in case you feel like any of your rights are being violated, which I mean is ridiculous because of course I did. I was a 14 year old who was admitted against my will. Now as a lawyer, I'm like, what? I was like, let's go do a charter challenge. Like, I don't even understand. Like, why did they give this to me? It was, it was nuts. Um, and you know, and they gave me a, a, like a menu to fill out, but they didn't explain to me how to fill out the menu or, or that I was expected to be gaining weight on this you know, like it was just, I remember filling out like carrot sticks, cottage cheese, because I, I just didn't, I didn't understand. It was, um, I was on a medical ward being treated for a mental illness. And so it was, 
weird situation. How frightening was it that first couple of weeks there? Because even if your parents are visiting, when they leave you, you're just a 14-year-old all by yourself. That part was okay. For the first time ever, I met other people who had the same illness as me. And so I felt a little bit understood. Um, But conversely, it was a behavior modification protocol where I was forced to sign this like contract. And I use the word contract in scare quotes that set out that I had to gain a hundred grams a day, which is not very much like picture, like a two power bars, like uh, uneaten power bars, like how much they weigh. And that's how much I had to gain. Um, and any day that I didn't gain that I was put on forced bed rest where they would take all of my possessions away, including my clothes. I had to wear a hospital gown and I had to stay in my room by myself. That sounds like I, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It was really terrible. I had nothing to do. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't talk on the phone. And there were, this was way before cell phones, obviously. Um, but I, so I, I couldn't do anything. And so it was just so isolating and so painfully boring. And you know, the thing they don't, and like a hundred grams sounds easy, right? Like no problem. But the thing that they didn't really account for is often people People who have, you know, anorexia, when they start eating again, their their metabolism goes into hyperdrive because your body's trying to do all this repairing. And so your metabolism is like, it speeds up. And so you sometimes you will eat all of the food that's put in front of you and you won't gain weight. And I didn't understand this. And so I was ending up on bed rest despite my best efforts. And so after a few days of winding up on bed rest, despite trying really hard to you know, to eat all the food in front of me, I thought this isn't going to work. I need to get out of here. I need to stay off bed rest. And I started water loading again in the hospital. This is Chatter That Matters. When we come back, Sherry tells the story of how her own child inadvertently caused her anorexic voice to once again speak up. Hi, this is Tony Chapman, host of the radio show and podcast Chatter That Matters. Did you know that only one in five youth with a mental health illness can get access to the care they need? Well, a big shout out to the RBC Foundation and RBC Future Launch for supporting over 150 youth mental health organizations. And in doing so, they help youth and their families get the care they need and deserve. You know, you don't have to have a clinical diagnosis to want to break free from diet culture and the weight, no pun intended, that it carries. I don't think that you have to be suffering all the time to be suffering. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. My guest today is Sherry Siegel Glick. She's written this brilliant book titled The Skinny, My Messy Hopeful Fight for Full Recovery from Anorexia. I encourage anybody to read it. And it's not just this morbid read because she has this incredible writing style and a sense of humor. You can read it also with sort of compassion and at times breathe, which I think is what makes this book so special. I need to fast track it just because of the interest of time. And I'm going to take the audience moving it forward to the fact that you've graduated from law school. I'm curious how you found the energy to accomplish that degree given that what it sounds like throughout that time, you're still struggling with anorexia. I mean, I was struggling with anorexia, but I was, and I also had a very, very time consuming exercise addiction. My food portions had increased at that point. You know, I I looked pretty healthy and normal, but I was also exercising compulsively, which was extremely time consuming. Um, But if you'd asked me if I had anorexia, I would say, no, 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 of course I don't. Like, no, of course not. Because I was in this like quasi recovered place. I found the academic part was fine and I had a part time job and that was also fine. But I also didn't really bond with people in the way that normally, you know, I would have or normally people do in undergrad or law school because I spent all of my free time at the gym. Well, somewhere along the way, Prince Charming shows up because you get married and you have three children. Were you open to him about your? what you thought might have been in the past, your anorexia, or did he just look at you and wonder how someone could eat so little and exercise so much? So by the time my husband, I met my husband, I was quasi recovered. So um, to my mind, because it was so much better than anything that I'd experienced previously, to my mind, I was actually recovered. So I don't feel like I was lying to him because I was also lying to myself. And I did frame it as something I'd been gone through in the past. And that was because I was worried about him finding out from someone else. Not because I thought it was something that he had to worry about now. But I was like, you know, this is something that happened to me in the past. This is also why I don't get menstrual periods. So if we want to have kids, you know, this might be an issue. I just want to flag this 
for you. You start a family, you feel you're, you know, quasi recovered, but you go to a psychologist and they sort of open up your, your mind to the concept that this is the battle that you're going to have possibly for the rest of your life. I don't think that's actually, I mean, I'm not trying to criticize, but I don't think that's an accurate description of what happened. Okay. So actually it was, you know, I'd had all of these years of quasi recovery. And then after the birth of my third child, um, I fell into sort of an accidental relapse because I was an energy deficit from breastfeeding. I lost my appetite. And um, so I was having a lot of trouble eating when I wasn't hungry because that's always been an issue for me. And then one day I got on the scale and realized that my that my weight was lower than I had anticipated. Like I knew that I'd lost weight because all of my clothes felt too big, but I didn't know how much weight I'd lost. And so I was like, I had this moment of sort of fear elation and sensing the elation part was really not a good thing. I made an appointment with a psychologist. It was a very, very long wait list. And so by the time my name came up, my hunger cues were back. And so I was eating again. And so I went to see her anyway, because I thought, well, I've been on this waiting list for like, you know, the same, like the length of time of most network sitcoms, you know, I might as well go see this woman and, and see if she can help me with these sort of residual behaviors that I still have. So I went to see her and she said, why are you here? And I said, well, you know, I made this appointment when I lost my appetite and I was having a lot of trouble eating, but now my hunger cues are back. Things are fine. Everything's fine. I just want to work on a couple of like residual behaviors that I have from when I used to have anorexia. And then she said, well, tell me about these behaviors. I can't eat when I'm not hungry. I have to weigh and measure everything I eat. You know, I'm afraid of oil in my food. I have to know the exact calorie count. I have to exercise this much per day. I feel like I have to walk everywhere. And that's when she said, you still have anorexia. And I said, no, no, of course I don't. Like I eat chocolate. Do people with anorexia eat chocolate? And she was like, yeah, sometimes, you know? And so, and I really had a lot of trouble believing her. And then I said, I don't actually think that that's true. And she said, fine. Okay, go home. Stop measuring your food. Stop exercising. Tell me how it goes. If you don't have anorexia, these things are going to be very easy for you to fix. And that's how I realized it was still a problem. But I also learned in that because of that session and subsequent sessions that there actually, it wasn't something I had to live with for the rest of my life. There was actually a way out and that these things that I thought were normal were actually not normal and that things could be better and different. So what did you do to really start tackling these issues? There there are a lot of things to, I, I stopped gradually. I stopped working out I had a plan where I was challenging fear foods. I stopped weighing and measuring my food, but these things all happened gradually. Didn't I didn't wake up one morning and do it all the same day. It, it, was, a, it was a process and recovery isn't linear. So, um, you know, some things are easier than other things. If I have my notes right, you did return to that hospital originally used to almost chain you to the bed when you didn't fall in line and to a day program. And you had to go back a couple of times because the first time it didn't work out, right? It was actually not the same hospital. It's an adjacent hospital because I was in the children's hospital the first time. And then it was the adjacent adult hospital. And so I did decide to go back because, you know, I'd had these behaviors for all of these years and doing these things on my own was really, really tough. And so this psychologist actually had said, you know, I think that you should consider doing this day hospital program. And even at the time, I was quite ambivalent. Um but decided to give it a go. One of the funny lines of your book is I was voluntarily, or I was fired from the voluntarily program, which I thought was just priceless. Yeah. So the first time I went twice, the first time um, I had a ridiculous fight over salad dressing with a dietitian, and I stormed out, which sounds, you know, it's really bizarre. I'm sure to anybody who doesn't struggle with these things and probably pretty relatable to people who do, because at the time salad dressing was a huge fear of mine. And we were fighting about how much I was going to put on my food. And uh, there was also sort of a big meal next to it. And I just had this like moment where I was like flooded with adrenaline. And she was like, you have to decide right now, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm out. And I stormed out. And then once you leave, you, you can't come back. I asked for my spot back and they said, no, I'm sorry, it's taken. Maybe we'll take you back in a couple of months. And so then a couple of months later, I went back again. Share the story about your teenage son and what he sent to you and how his words amplified 
so many words from your past. Yeah. So I was um, upstairs. I was, you know, it was a school day. We're always sort of rushed on school days in my house. And I was just blow my hair in my bathroom. And I was wearing my brawn underwear. And my son was yelling at me to come find something in my house that obviously nobody could see except me because it's invisible, apparently, to everyone else. And I ran down the stairs, you know, f- frustrated and like gave him the thing that he was looking for. It was like, here you go. And I was walking back up the stairs and I thought he was like money. And I thought he was going to say thank you, which would have been amazing. But he instead he said, you're gaining weight. Sorry if this sounds rude, but you're gaining weight. That was sort of jarring to me because this kid is not a perceptive child. You know, we could replace his sisters with stunt doubles tomorrow and he may or may not notice. It, it was it was quite jarring because it, uh, you know, I knew that I had gained weight, but I didn't know that other people were noticing. I really had to reflect in that moment about what I was doing and why I was doing it and why I wanted to keep going. You know, Sherry, you've lived through a mental illness. You've battled anorexia, but you're very open up front talking about addiction in general and words and how important they are, positive or negative. I'm curious what advice you'd give to people that are struggling with addiction or their friends or family that are starting to notice these behaviors or living with these behaviors. Is there anything that you can think of or advise, not so much from a psychiatrist or psychologist point of view, because that's not what you are, but somebody has lived it. I mean, I don't think that I can speak to all addictions because I don't know that it's the same. I can only speak to what I lived. Um, So I think that if you're somebody who is struggling with food and exercise and your body, I think that it's worth knowing that things can be different and better. Diet culture is pervasive and pernicious. And it's only when we stop and reflect on what we're doing and why we're doing these things that we can make changes. You know, sometimes it feels okay and normal to be doing juice fasts and and working out excessively because you get, you know, so much approval from the people around you. But ultimately it's how you're feeling and how how it makes you feel. And if you are carrying around this, you know, weight, no pun intended, of of constantly feeling not good enough, um, or this like sort of like all this like noise in your head about, you know, exercise and food and calories, you can make changes and um, things can be better. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. You don't have to keep hurting yourself to feel loved. I promise. Right now, it feels like a drug. You can numb out all of your problems and focus all that energy into restriction. But that numbness actually means you're missing your life. And the more numb you get, the less you realize what you're missing. And if this keeps up, you're going to miss everything. My guest today is Sherry Siegel Glick. She's published her first book titled The Skinny, My Messy Hopeful Fight for Full Recovery from Anorexia. You know, you talked about that was then and this was kind of, that was the norm now. And then you said, you know, I'm very different in terms of how I deal with my three children. But you're also now you're dealing with the world of social media and Instagram and chasing false beauty stereotypes and Kardashians and Photoshopping. I mean, I worked on the Dove brand for years. I mean, it's it's pervasive. How could we counter that? How, what advice can you give to people so that maybe their children or maybe themselves aren't so consumed with it, which is obviously very photoshopped and just happy with who they see? Yeah. I mean, I think so much of it is knowing that it's recovery of, of any type isn't really about pleasing other people. It's about what feels good to you. And, you know, we have, it's, it's, it's cheesy because it gets said all the time, but it's actually the truth that we have one life, you know? So if you want to spend your one life constantly feeling terrible about your body um, or counting your calories or worrying about exercise, that might not be the best way to spend, to spend your time. Um, You know, in terms of our children, I think, not commenting on their appearance is so important. Commenting on what their bodies can do is so meaningful. Um, you know, not labeling food as good and bad, not saying things like a lot of the time people say things because they are brought up hearing these things and don't really reflect on them. Um, but saying things about, you know, I can have this piece of cake because I earned it. Um, you know, it's just like off the cuff comments that we've heard our whole lives, like just reflecting on them and not repeating them because you know, it's cyclical, right? And so we repeat what we've heard and then we repeat that to our children and then their children repeat it. And so it's just sort of changing your mindset and ending the cycle 
here with you. And how important was it for you to write this book? Was this a way that you could say, I, I really feel I'm at a point in my life where I've closed this chapter. I am healthy. I have found a way to be the person I want to be versus what I thought I should be. Um, you know, it was important to me because I wanted, um, again, like I was saying earlier, I really feel like there was just so much shame and stigma around eating disorders. And um, I wanted to be a, a, a positive voice so that people feel less shame and know that things can be different and better. Um, there are also a lot of misconceptions around eating disorders that I wanted to clear up. I also is not just written for people who have eating disorders, it's written for people who have ever felt unhappy with their bodies, which is like most people at some point in their lives. You know, anybody who's kind of stuck in diet culture, just to give a different voice to what we hear all the time in the media. I always end my show with my three takeaways. The first one that is so important is the sense that you talked about earlier, addiction is addiction. And we tend as society to label addiction a certain way because I can see someone that's visibly drunk. I can see somebody that's very stoned. But eating disorder is something very different. And I think it's an important lesson in life for us to realize that obsessive behavior, people chasing false beauty stereotypes, is no different than somebody that has to gamble their entire life savings in the hope of getting a hit. Second thing is that I thought the, you know, you talked about this importance of sharing information and extending it beyond anorexia to just how people feel about their bodies. I think it's an important thing because I think you're right. Everybody looks at themselves in the mirror and everybody has a certain level of critique because we're living in a society where we're judged. Third thing that I learned about, and I think one of the most important lessons I've learned in Chatter That Matters is words matter. Whether they're positive or negative, they can have a lasting impact. And things, saying things like, I earned the right to have this cake, or you look so pretty or so beautiful can have the same negative impact. So really thank you for joining me. I think the book, The Skinny, is a must read for people and not just for people that are dealing with anorexia, not even just people dealing with their issues with their bodies, but just people trying to come to terms with, it's just beautiful to be who you are. So Sherry, thank you for joining me in Chatter That Matters. Mm, thanks so much for having me. Even if you're a, a light listener to the show, you're going to know the name I'm about to share with you. Amy Deacon, she's the founder and CEO of Toronto Wellness Counseling. She long ago set a record for most times on the show because I always go to her to talk about human nature and the nature of things. And this show today was particularly hard for me. It's with Sherry Siegel Glick. And why it was hard is I worked on the Dove brand for eight years and I started looking at what happened to these happy girls that were skipping and dancing. But as soon as they were hitting puberty, it was suddenly about their body image. They were chasing false beauty stereotypes. They were chasing Instagram and, and magazines and all of this sort of retouched and refurbished and faux look. A lot of times that manifests into depression, sadness, but in some cases, even worse, anorexia. And that's what, she, as you know, from Sherry suffered from, even though when she thought she was cured, she realized she wasn't. So Amy, sorry, that was a long introduction, but welcome to Chatter That Matters. Thank you for having me, Tony. What's going on? Why, why are we dealing with this in society? What's causing it? And what do you do when someone comes in your office that you can even see that they're starving themselves into such illness or even death? You know, it's one thing to abstain from, say, alcohol or drug use, but we need to eat. Like you, you, you actually have to encounter food on a daily basis. And for a lot of people that struggle with whether it's anorexia or bulimia, their identity is tied to their weight. Their identity, their sense of self-worth is dependent on their thinness. And it's wild, but it's often really encouraged. You look great. You look fantastic. And, and we, we, we really praise unhealthy thinness, especially when we look at models and, and it's become so much more insidious with social media, with the filters. And I literally just learned this, but you, you can carve out a waist. You can Photoshop yourself now and it's, and people won't know the difference. There's always been a pressure, particularly on women to, to be beautiful, right? To be socially presentable. And the roots of that we still see them today, except for we're living in this digital age where it's never been easier to kind of adjust the way that you look. And, and also it's never been easier to consume 
images of what beauty looks like, even though it is so distorted. Such brilliant insight. An alcoholic has to quit alcohol, but someone with anorexia has to eat. How do you deal with that? I mean, how do you get them to come to terms with the fact that they need to, you often use the word nurture. They have to nurture their body with food. There's no one answer. There's so many kind of different interventions, but I'll give you just a a sense of a few of them. So one is you have to start to diversify what beauty means. There's a heavy emphasis that beauty is about what does your body look like and particularly what is the size of your body as opposed to what does my hair look like and what clothes do I really enjoy wearing? And also, what about my insides are beautiful? What about the content of my character is beautiful? Is it my kindness, my generosity, my empathy? And to really start to unpack that and make more space for that, right? Because the disease of anorexia says it's all about how thin you are. Very, very intense. And more of the more uh, practical way of how we treat anorexia is actually just gently, it's almost like an exposure therapy where people truly believe if I have that extra slice of bread, game over. Obesity, overnight. It's very insidious, Tony. And so there's there's this sense of let's start to let's start to just consume a little bit more. And if when we gain a couple of pounds, is it life or death or are you okay? And typically what we find is that old saying of the anticipation is much worse than the actual event. So there's so much fear about how horrible and destructive my life will be if I go from 98 pounds to 107. But when we actually get to 107, you're okay. You actually sleep better and you feel better. You have more energy and your hair isn't falling out and you're getting your period back. So there's, there's a real learning process that goes along with the treatment. And the last thing I would say though, is that the person has to feel so safe because when you're, when you're working with, with an eating disorder, the, the person is so likely to get defensive about it because in a really strange way, the eating disorder helps them to feel safe. It helps them to feel in control. Such powerful insight. And Amy Deacon, thank you once again for being part of Chatter That Matters. My pleasure. Chatter That Matters has been a presentation of RBC. It's Tony Chapman. Let's chat soon.